Mueller, She Wrote is brought to you by Murder Book, a new true crime podcast hosted by best-selling author Michael Connolly, available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Also, be sure to check out Dark Sacred Night, Michael Connolly's latest number one bestseller, featuring detectives Harry Bosch and Renee Ballard. And thanks to Buffy for supporting Mueller, She Wrote. For $20 off your Buffy comforter, visit Buffy.co and enter promo code AG. Finally, thanks to Beachbody for supporting Mueller, She Wrote. Right now, our listeners can get a special free trial membership, including their new 14-day results plan, where you can lose up to nine pounds in the first two weeks. So text AG to 303030 now. So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I did have, not have communications with the Russians. What do I have to get involved with Putin for? I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. So, it is political. You're a communist. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. Like all members of the oldest profession, I'm a capitalist. Hello, and welcome to Muller She Wrote. I'm your host, A.G. With me, as always, is Jaleesa Johnson. Hello. And Jordan Coburn. Hello. Well, this has been an interesting week. Uh, it's day 29 of the Trump shutdown, and we are helping out one of our patrons. We'll call her A.M., Head to GoFundMe and search for MSW Patron to donate so we can help her pay her rent and her bills. Uh, we've already raised about 2500 bucks, so thanks to all of you for your kindness. Uh, today is the National Women's March, and of course Trump is pissy because the news isn't about him, it's about ladies. <laughs> so he went on television today um, to talk about some bullshit deal, of some shit we already have. He's trying to basically, like he'll, he goes into your house and pulls a picture off your wall and says, I'll give you this if you give me money. <laughs> Uh, also, our MSW Live Tour is taking shape. We will be at the Miracle Theater in Washington, D.C. March 29th, and we'll be at the Bell House in Brooklyn on March 30th. Doors at 6 p.m., shows at 7. Stay tuned for patron VIP cocktail meet and greet details. We still don't have those details worked out, but we're trying to get that done. We'll be posting the ticket link on our website on Monday. So remember, that's not going to be available on there till Monday. Uh, and sometimes we release this episode early Sunday nights if we get done editing it in time. So head uh, to MullerSheWrote.com for all of our tour details. As we get them, we'll update the website, probably just right on the front page. Also, our fucked clip, as recorded by Voices of Our City Choir, a nonprofit group, is available for purchase as a ringtone, with part of the proceeds going to Voices of Our City Choir. That's a choir for homeless people in San Diego. Um, such a great cause. Julissa, can you play that ringtone for us? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, Jordan, where can folks get a hold of this ringtone? So, it's available anywhere that you buy ringtones. Uh, we got a good deal. You can look it up on your iTunes ringtone app, or if you have a Google phone or a HTC or whatever you got, look it up. Title of the ringtone is going to be Manafort is dot dot dot, and it's by Muller She Wrote. Yes. And thanks again to Voices of Our City Choir um, and also San Diego Gay Men's Chorus for making our beams come true <laughs> with this. All proceeds go to them. So, we love you. And thanks for putting together that little bit of goodwill for us. We have a jam-packed show, guys. A couple of corrections from last week. I mixed up Woodward and Bernstein uh, <laughs> in the midweek episode. Sorry, fellas. Nobody caught it. Not even me. Uh, if <laughs> I was wondering if they were, like, co-writers or something, and maybe Woodward just is a credit holder. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have made sense. <laughs> no, Woodward wrote the book. <laughs> Bernstein is, is the other guy, Carl. They worked together. They, they did a lot together back in the old Watergate times and have ever since. Uh, so I mixed up my old white guys again. I do it a lot. <laughs> um, sorry, y'all guys look all the same. Uh, I wanted um, to let you know if you want to access this midweek update that we've been putting out for the last two weeks, just head to patreon.com slash Mueller She Wrote and sign up to be a Patreon. You also get ad-free episodes, um, the entire archive of bonus episodes and weekly newsletters with my show notes, all kinds of free gifts. Totes worth it, starting at three bucks a month. 
You also get our full-length unedited interviews. And today, we'll be interviewing staff writer for The Atlantic and MSNBC contributor Natasha Bertrand. Uh, And we also have NBC legal analyst Maya Wiley and former Watergate prosecutor and NBC contributor Jill Weinbanks, who is just a national treasure. Uh, Jaleesa, you have an update for us on... What is your update today? What's your hot note? Oh, yeah. So my hot note is basically on Nasty Ripka and and what's going down with her. Yeah. Update on sex coach for sure. Mm -hmm. Kind of terrifying update. Uh, And Jordan, you have Kaludi Rudy. Yeah. Another (laughs) installation of the Lube the Truth tour going on (laughs) national television and saying some shit he said was the opposite of what he said. Well said. (laughs) Luby Giuliani. (laughs) Talking about him today. Gross. Uh, I'm going to go over the BuzzFeed drama from later in the week this week. We have a lot to get to today, so uh, let's jump in with just the facts. All right, all the way back to Saturday night after we recorded, which seems like a decade ago, uh, uh, the Washington Post dropped a story that Trump had gone to great lengths to conceal the content of his meetings with Putin, including confiscating notes from his American interpreter and telling that person not to reveal any of the meeting details to anyone, especially uh, those in in his administration. He didn't want the grown-ups to know. Uh, what he and Putin had talked about. If he destroyed those notes, that would be a violation of the Presidential Records Act. Uh, And as we know, Trump had an undocumented hour-long discussion with Putin at the G20 the day before he dictated the false statement about the Trump Tower meeting from June 2016 being about adoptions to Don Jr. Threw his kid under the bus on that one, too. (laughs) He's like, oh, I dictated it. He wrote it. But I dictated it. And he basically just implicated his kid in uh, obstruction of justice. Um, some allege that Putin dictated that response to the Trump family because he had that secret conversation with Putin the night before. Melania was there and a Russian interpreter was there. Mm-hmm. Nobody has any idea what was said. Only Trump and, yeah. and Putin. Putin would be the expert on how to cover that up. He he would definitely have... I could see how it would be his idea to tell them it's about adoptions. I like the Putin name. It makes me think of Putin Tang. <laughs> Putin Tang? Yeah. yeah. Putin Tang? Yeah. Okay, that's his name now. It's an orange drink that makes you... Murder people <laughs> makes you turn orange because Trump is drinking that. Apparently. Drink it in the space force. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the Russian Kool Aid. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, the Kremlin Kool Aid. There you go. An alliteration. Tang Putin. Tang the Kremlin Kool Aid. <laughs> All right, you guys. Sunday night, Trump called into the Judge Janine Pirro show on Fox and failed to answer whether or not he was working for Russia and. He tampered with a witness on live television by threatening Michael Cohen's father-in-law. In response, Cummings, Nader, and Schiff, those are the three new chairs, Democratic chairs of some of the House Oversight, Intel, and Judiciary Committees, uh, not some of them, those three committees, um, they wrote a letter to Justice calling him out for it, um, saying it's a blatant felony perpetrated in plain sight. Um, but the week just got worse for Trump from that day on, so we'll go over that. Also Sunday night, Carl Bernstein, not Bob Woodward told CNN he has a source that's seen the draft of the Mueller report and that it says Trump helped Putin destabilize the United States. Bernstein's sources are pretty solid, so I take that as fact. Um, And there were reports that Trump had been fuming in the White House saying he's been getting crushed. I'm crushed on the shutdown. I'm getting crushed. We're getting crushed. Uh, And Kaludi Rudy even said that the Mueller report will be devastating. Um, It's still being reported that Mueller will release his findings in late February. I don't know how the hell he's... I had to write, like, one script this weekend. I couldn't even get it out in time, (laughs) so I don't know how he's going to do this. Um, I guess he's got, you know, 800 angry Democrats working for him. True, that's right, yeah. Angry Democrat. The Mueller Terry. Trans... (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Angry transcribers. Um, Let's see. Also, Sunday, the Daily Beast reported that the Kremlin blessed Russians NRA operations, according to the United States, a United States intelligence report. Jordan, what were some of the details of that story? You went over that in the midweek update. Yeah, pretty much. We learned that back in 2015, Alexander Torshin, as far back as 2015, um, he had, in fact, been briefing the Kremlin on his attempts to infiltrate the NRA. Previously, they tried to really separate themselves from that. People, even if you'll remember, tried calling uh, Butina a free agent sort of person that wasn't acting on behalf of the Kremlin. Well, we know she was acting on behalf of Torshin, and Torshin was probably acting on behalf of the Kremlin. 
And that's pretty yeah. much the most consequential part of that is there was way more connections to the Kremlin than they're like to, you know, they like to say. Yeah, and I think the I think the point of that is that they the Kremlin wasn't necessarily hiring them and deploying them, but they were saying, here's what we're doing, and the Kremlin's like very good. Right, and they also said, hey Kremlin, you probably want to get in on this because in the event that a Republican wins the 2016 election, you're really going to want the influence and the connection with their base, which the NRA encapsulates entirely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they were good with that too. Um, thank you. So, let's see. Monday, uh, we learned that Steve King, known racist. Uh, was condemned in a 424 to 1 vote (laughs) in the House for his comments when he asked why the terms white supremacy, white nationalism, and Western civilization had become offensive. When did those become offensive? (laughs) Like, a really long time ago, buddy. Um, 424 to 1. And the one guy was like, it doesn't go far enough. I want to punch this guy in the face. (laughs) Can we put something in here where I can punch him in the face too? Um, Steve King also lost all his committee seats for those comments, and rightfully so. He should know better that... It's, uh, you know, it's okay to say you're a nationalist, like Trump did, but not a white nationalist. The white is silent, <laughs> as I said in the midweek episode. Uh, we also learned Monday that Mueller had asked for a face-to-face follow-up after he, receives Trump, after he received Trump's written interview answers, and the administration said no. Uh, for five weeks, Mueller tried to negotiate um, an interview until eventually Rudy said Trump will not be answering any more questions face to face or otherwise in the Mueller probe over my dead body. I might be dead, he said, but over my dead body. So now yeah, I wonder if he's sick. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> so now we wait to see if Mueller subpoenas him, basically, if he's going to write a report and not bother or if he's going to shove a subpoena up his butt, subpoena butt stuff. Um, <laughs> also, Monday, we learned that not only did Bill Barr send a memo to justice, the Department of Justice, about the president being above the law, pretty much. But he also sent a memo to the White House as well. Uh, of course, I put some super space beans on a theory that Barr and Mueller are super good friends. And Barr wrote these memos to get the uh, you know attorney general job so he could protect the Mueller investigation. But that's probably totally not true at all. Uh, I call it justice porn. <laughs> So the William Barr confirmation hearings took place this week, and joining us to discuss the hearings is former Watergate prosecutor and NBC and MSNBC contributor Jill Wine-Banks. Jill, welcome to Mueller, she wrote. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you. Very excited to talk to you. Uh, I've been a long time watching your uh, commentary for a long time, and uh, we're very excited to have you. And it seemed to me, uh, just off the top as I was watching the, the hearings, the confirmation hearings this week, that Barr seem to keep dancing around a commitment to release a full-throated Mueller report. Uh, Jill, what was your top-line takeaway from, from the confirmation hearings this week? I completely agree with you. Um, he had very, um, very good reasons, he said, for why he was taking the position he did. But there are very valid reasons why he should make a full report and make everything available, whatever that is. First of all, to the extent that he claimed that the rules and regulations barred him from doing it, he can change the rules and regulations if he's the attorney general because the attorney general sets those rules. So that's a very, very weak excuse for not releasing it. There will certainly be parts of it that I would agree um, are grand jury testimony that can't be released for one reason or another, but the conclusions can be. And I I think there's a lot that can be learned, but I also think, and I want to point out that I think that hearings in the House are absolutely essential, and that's a way to get good public education. And that's really critical, is people need to know the facts and the truth so that they can evaluate for themselves how they feel about what the president has done, what the president knows, when he knew it. Those are important questions. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it was so critical that the Dems um, got won back the House. And, uh, you know, we were very, uh, you know, breathed a huge sigh of relief, at least uh, uh, on our side, when that when we did, when we took the House back because of those hearings. And um, you brought up the grand jury. And that that wants that leads me to the next question here, because in recent months, uh, the Jaworski report of the grand jury findings in Watergate was <clears throat> unsealed or released to the public, which set kind of a legal precedent, or at least revealed what the legal precedent was, that, you know, normally super secret grand jury findings 
uh, don't make their way anywhere outside of the grand jury room. But in this report, they did make their way to the House Judiciary Committee. Now, do you know if the AG at the time during Watergate had to approve that report going forward to the judiciary or if the judge just decided to send it directly to the House? This was done on the authority of the grand jury on their inherent powers. Now, obviously, our team advised the grand jury of what they had the power to do and helped them to make the pieces of evidence that would make a compelling case. It did not include any uh, conclusions of guilt. It simply pointed the way to a variety of activities that the House should investigate as part of their ongoing impeachment inquiry. And remember, we had already had a Senate oversight hearing, which had partly educated the public and made them ready to understand and believe what was in this report. And also, the impeachment group had already started looking at the facts. So we had a ready audience for what we were doing. And I am sorry. Judge Sirica um, agreed with our proposal that it go to the House for their consideration as part of their impeachment uh, hearings. And the courts upheld it. And so they did get the information and were free to go ahead and call witnesses and make certain things public. Because witnesses before the grand jury can talk outside the grand jury. It's just that the prosecutors cannot talk about what they said, but they are free to say it. So if some other jurisdiction calls them in and says, we'd like to hear what you said to the grand jury, those witnesses can identify that. Okay. And in, in today's, in, you know, this investigation, using that roadmap set out by Jaworski with the grand jury uh, releasing not, not their conclusions, but their findings to the House, does that have to make a stop at the, at the attorney general's office before it's permitted to go to the House or do the, does it just go straight there? I think in the rules and regs that currently exist, it might have to because it would be a significant action that would be the kind that is defined as ones that he might have to get, he, Mueller, would have to get um, approved. Okay, and that, that was kind of my big worry. Uh, not worry, but, you know, one, one of the concerns that everyone just should be aware that this will probably still have to make a stop in the AG's office before it's, it's, before it's handed it's over. It's possible. I mean, I think there are ways that you could argue, um, and I haven't really researched this, but I'm sure that Mueller has, because um, at least one member of the Watergate team, um, not our trial team, but in the Watergate office, um, is working for Mueller. And I think that he would certainly be aware of, I mean, obviously the country is now aware of our roadmap. And I think that, remember I said, it's based on the inherent authority of the grand jury who goes to the judge and says, there is a reason to violate grand jury secrecy and to pass this on because of the public interest in the information. And in this particular case where there's an ongoing impeachment hearing, we have evidence that they should be aware of. And so I think there is a way that Mueller could say, I can't go to the judge, but you, the grand jury, if you feel that there is something that you want the Congress to do, I can tell you that you have the power to go to him. And that could happen without going through the AG. Okay, that makes sense. That's good to know. Um, thanks for clarifying I'm not, that for I'm us. Not, I'm not positive on that. I mean, I haven't researched it to see if there is a, a legal impediment, but it's certainly something I would try. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Agreed. Um, finally, last thing I wanted to ask you about, we all know Michael Cohen is going to be testifying publicly to Congress February 7th, and a lot of folks have been referring to him as the John Dean of stupid Watergate, and I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, technically, Cohen is a lawyer, technically, uh, and he will be publicly testifying to Congress about the president, but I think that's where the similarities end for me. And to borrow a phrase, I know John Dean and Cohen is no John Dean. And I was wondering, <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, given your expertise on Watergate, uh, Watergate one, uh, as a prosecutor, do you think Cohen is really the modern day John Dean? I would have to agree with your assessment. I don't know 
uh, Michael Cohn. I do know John Dean, and John Dean was, number one, an extraordinary witness with an extraordinary memory and a desire to completely come forward. Um, and so he was a unique and wonderful um, opportunity for us to get the truth out. And when he testified the first time before the Senate, there was no knowledge that there was a taping system. He had no knowledge about that at all and testified completely truthfully. And then, of course, later found out that there were tapes and either those tapes were going to corroborate him or they were going to just totally destroy his credibility. And as you know, they completely corroborated. When he said on March 21st, I said there was a cancer on the presidency, we subpoenaed that tape. And sure enough, that's exactly what it said. And every other tape that he talked about where he had a conversation with the president proved to be true. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would think maybe, and I know Don McGahn hasn't testified publicly. I, I'd say he's closer to the John Dean. He spent 30 hours with special counsel. Uh, and he is the White House counsel, which is different from a personal lawyer as far as what your job is. And so I think that might be a closer comparison than, than Cohen. Well, OK, I agree completely that Don McGahn would be a closer comparison because um, these were actions of the president and he was in the White House with the president, whereas Michael Cohen wasn't. But some of the potential crimes committed by um, the president now president, were committed when Michael Cohn was his lawyer. But I don't think when people say he's the Michael, uh, he's the John Dean of this investigation, I don't think they're referring to the fact that there's a lawyer relationship. Um, I think they're making the analogy that John Dean was a devastating witness against the president. He had facts, he had knowledge, he knew the ins and outs. And I think to some extent, Michael Cohn knows the ins and outs of some of the business wrongdoing. I mean, we know, you know, the payoffs, there may be zoning violations, there may be a million other things um, that Michael Cohn knows about. I think Weisselberg could be the John Dean in terms of dramatic evidence against the president. We don't know who the John Dean, because when I say that, I mean, who is the one who can really give us the information the details that will be grounds for action that will prove a case to even the most loyal Trump supporters. Yeah, I agree 100 percent with exactly what you're saying. It's really the the drama of what John Dean had uh, to say. And, you know, who knows, right? We, we, we could have several John Deans uh, in this in this investigation. Honestly, in most trials that I've ever been involved in, you don't have one witness who goes from A to Z. John Dean was unique in that. And, and even John Dean wasn't enough. I mean, we, uh, Jeb Magruder played a crucial role. There were a lot of, you know, major witnesses that put the case together. And of course, in our case, major witness was the president against himself as recorded by himself. So that's an important distinction. But a witness with dramatic evidence is what I call the John Dean of this investigation. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, I agree. And um, I think that, you know, going forward with what's going to be able to be released, I, I think because of the expertise that's in the Mueller team and, and Mueller already probably sorting all this out, uh, all the possible uh, conclusions, um, not that he's going to draw conclusions, but end game, end games uh, that we'll get. I think we'll be able to get the information Mueller wants us to get in some way, shape or form. I think so. And I think also because the House is now in Democratic hands and has subpoena power, they have a way of getting the evidence to the public. And it's so important that the public get the evidence. If it's guilty or not guilty, either way, we all have a right to know and need to know. So that's my general feeling. Yes. And I think that that's what Mueller's charged with is is getting at the truth and i think that we'll find yeah. that so everybody rest easy uh i know it's stressful waiting for the results to come out but i think uh, i think we can breathe and relax get some sleep um thank you so much for speaking with us today you're in you're welcome but i just want to add it i'm saying it's Mueller's responsibility but it's also congress's and i don't just mean the democratic house i mean 
the Democratic and Republicans in the House and the Senate. Both of them are obligated to the public who elected them to make sure that the public is educated about this one way or the other so we can move on to do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. He's not he's not a white knight, Mueller. He's going to give his yes. findings. He's going to present his evidence. That's his job. He's a prosecutor. He's an investigator. And it's going to be up to Congress, the people, Department of Justice, uh, what we do with that information. We all have a part to play. So I appreciate you coming on, speaking with us today. Your insights are invaluable. You are a national treasure. Uh, former Watergate Thank prosecutor. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no problem. Former Watergate prosecutor, MSNB, MSNBC contributor, Jill Wine-Banks. Jill, thanks so much for being on Mueller She Wrote today. Thank you, AG. I enjoyed it. Now. All right, cool. Be safe. Thanks. Bye. 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 All right, guys. We'll be right back. Hey, Mueller junkies. Thanks to Murder Book, the new true crime podcast hosted by bestselling author Michael Connolly for supporting Mueller, she wrote. Returning to his roots as a journalist, bestselling author Michael Connolly now presents the true crime podcast Murder Book. Working with the very detectives who inform his novels and his hit TV show Bosch, the podcast explores real homicide cases not covered by the mainstream media. Murder Book Season 1 is called The Telltale Bullet, and it dives into this 30-year-old Hollywood carjacking gone wrong that tests the limits of the American criminal justice system. Kind of like a current Hmm. crime testing the limits of the American justice system. Good point. Also from Michael Connelly, Dark Sacred Night, his latest number one bestseller featuring detectives Harry Bosch and Renee Ballard. You can find Dark Sacred Night wherever books are sold. So... The thing that I really love about this guy's podcast is the way that he presents these crimes. It's different. It's like it's different from how you normally get your true crime. And I'm I'm a true crime junkie, uh, as we all know. But I just his the way he he tells a story is really gripping, and I really appreciate his like the details and the experience and the experts that he that have like give him his information oh yeah definitely i like how obscure it is i feel like that's really interesting looking for something that's like standing out from the rest of mainstream media type of stories things you can tell someone about that they definitely haven't heard about and sound cool yeah yeah that's it you have brand new true crime to share with people (laughs) yeah and also i like the element that you mentioned before of tying it into these dynamics that are still playing out in very real ways in our political situation right now and that they're stories that exemplify you know dynamics and humanity that are showing up time and time again. Yeah, the justice system aspect is super... I'm so glad he's, he's like subsumed that into this podcast. So you guys, be sure to check out Michael Connolly's new Murder Book Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts or head to murderbookpodcast.com. That's murderbookpodcast.com. You'll be glad you did. All right, guys, welcome back. We left off Monday. We're still on Monday. Uh, with another Daily Beast story about Mueller's interest in an event attended by Nunez, Flynn, and a grip of foreign officials at Trump's D.C. hotel. Jordan covered this midweek. I believe you referred to it as collusion and croissants. Yes. Yes. Cl- yeah. I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yep, exactly that. It was the name of the episode of our Patreon midweek episode. Evening. Collusion and croissant? Collusion and croissant. Yes. Oh. Um, so Mueller's been looking into this meeting because it contained a bunch of players that have kind of proven to be sketchy fucks, really. <laughs> Uh, to put it to put it lightly, uh, but he's he's looking into this. Uh, it's all the drama that's surrounding Trump's inaugural committee, basically, and how they may have misspent funds. Also, looking into if the people that donated were trying to buy influence in the Trump administration, and also if foreign actors used the fund to give money to Trump's inaugural fund through intermediaries. So Devin Nunes was there. Michael Flynn was there which we know is a person that's not in a good place and a bunch of other foreign <laughs> officials were there and it took place at trump's dc hotel so we'll see yeah. i think cri- uh, criminals kind of hang out together michael flynn's not in a good spot and devin nunes just sucks all around so well hey michael flynn if you're looking for more cooperation like the judge said that you better get in order to get like not a whole bunch of jail time maybe this is something you could help him out with what was nunes doing there is this why nunes acts like a f- fucking dickhead is because <laughs> He, you know. Yeah, and this meeting happened only a couple days before the inauguration itself, and then shortly after this meeting and the inauguration is when Nunes opened up that HIC investigation, that complete sham of an investigation. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Little squid pro quo there. Yeah. Would you like some beans with your croissant? <laughs> <laughs> croissant on beans. Uh, I don't know. That was a weird accent. Also Monday, <laughs> we learned that Trump has been floating the idea of backing out of NATO for the past year at least, which would be the ultimate Putin payoff. Leaving NATO would uh, be disastrous globally, and much like the plan to withdraw from Syria, we would be abandoning our allies. 
And I can't help uh, but think if this were 1941, Trump would join the Axis and fight alongside the fascists. Yeah, I mean, that's what's <laughs> happening right now, right? They're like the new Axis. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. my biggest fear is like if we get, go into a war, we're not going to be on the right side. Oh, um, and don't fuck with NATO, bro. Don't fuck with NATO. Just listen to AG. <laughs> also, SCOTUS met this week just to discuss whether or not they'd let the secret company from country A in the super secret mm-hmm. subpoena battle where they shut down the courthouse and nobody knows who it is. Um, so they they were discussing whether or not they were going to let that company or from country A have their appeal on the merits argued under seal in secret. Um, there are no reports out yet about any decision they reached. But if they deny the request, the company would have to file a public merits appeal with SCOTUS if they wanted to continue their appeal, and we would all have to find out who they were. Um, That could also be refused by SCOTUS. If they refuse to hear that, um, then they're not going to hear the appeal at all, and then the lower court's decision would stand, which, of course, went in favor of Mueller. Uh, I'm 100% sure, no matter the outcome, Mueller will emerge victorious, and the (laughs) company will have to hand over their documents if they want to continue to do business in the United States. Uh, apparently, this company, whoever it is, does substantial business in the United States, so it's in their best interest uh, to comply with the subpoena. As you know, I think the company from country A is the Cutter Investment Authority, also known as the QIA, because they have U.S. offices that do significant business, and the Mueller prosecutor working on the case worked on the Flynn piece, and Flynn met with Cohen and an official from the Cutter Investment Authority in Trump Tower, and she's fluent in Arabic, the Mueller Um, prosecutor who was working on the Flynn case. I could be totally wrong, but put some cautious beans on it, I guess, if you're a patron (laughs) and you guess the identity of company, the company from country A correctly in our closed Facebook group uh, on the pinned announcement, you will get 10 points in the fantasy indictment. Oh, yeah. That's big. It is big because Trump is 20 points. So (laughs) 10 is big. That's half a Trump. (laughs) Half a Trump. It's a junior. (laughs) No, junior's with 20 points, too. Oh, that's right. That's more like a stone Oh, yeah. It's still big. (laughs) Big beans, yeah. Big stone beans. Uh, A federal judge ruled Tuesday that Wilbur Ross misled Congress to the Trump administration, and the Trump administration will not be allowed to include a question about citizenship on the 2020 census. That is a big win for voting rights and for federal funding. Julissa, you reported on this last week. Oh, yeah. It's basically that. They said you can't have this racist question. It's going to scare people away from participating in the census. And uh, that translates to a lack of funds in the communities if they decide not to fill out the census. So it seems like it's the administration's way of getting minorities to to not represent themselves and it's really fucked up yeah because of uh, thinking about it if i were uh, an undocumented immigrant or like a dreamer or if my parents were mm-hmm. i wouldn't want to answer that question and be like hey here we are this is our address and it's here's scary where we live and yeah we i'll don't. trust you guys so that's cool <laughs> i'm sure it's fine you're keeping a database it's totally cool right uh yeah no no thank you so we won yay then we learned that Mueller called Corsi's stepson before his grand jury based on text messages between the stepson and Jerome Corsi about scrubbing Corsi's computer, the one that sat on his desk. And Corsi alleges that he wanted his stepson to scrub the computer so he could give it to his mom, um, though that's not mentioned in the texts as far as we know. The story comes from Corsi himself, so keep that in mind. Uh, and Corsi has refused to submit to Mueller's subpoena and rejected a plea deal, releasing his draft plea agreement to the public from Mueller. And uh, we call that going full Nunberg. So if you remember, uh, Nunberg made the rounds on television, saying he would never answer uh, Mueller's subpoena until um, NBC... Um, legal analyst and professor of public and urban policy talked him off the ledge that day and convinced him to respond to the subpoena. It would be in his best interest. And that person was Maya Wiley, and she's joining us today. Maya, welcome to Mueller, she wrote. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So how in the world were you able to convince Sam Nudberg to change his mind? You know... That is an excellent question. <laughs> I, I maybe only Sam Nunberg can answer it. Uh, you know, in the moment of the discussion, I mean, first of all, there was no way of knowing what that discussion was going to be like. I certainly came on ready to simply provide the independent analysis, along with uh, Barbara, um, about how uh, a lawyer see this, why. You know, Mueller would subpoena Sam Nunberg. You know, it was, it was just supposed to be straight legal commentary and sort of the independent, neutral look. Uh, it just, I, I was so astounded by the things he was saying that it just, 
took a turn and I just started talking to him like I would talk to anybody because it, I, I don't, you know, he, he mentioned his father and talked about his father not agreeing and being worried for him. And I was like, of course your father's worried for you because your father loves you. And why are you doing this to your dad? <laughs> I mean, that was literally the mom in me was going, don't do this to your daddy. Just comply with the subpoena. And it, and and that was kind of the way it all happened. I mean, it was completely unplanned. This was probably obvious. And at the time, you know, I had no idea of the impact. I really just wanted Sam to see how his reasoning was going to hurt him. That's all I wanted. I just wanted him to see like that statement he made about, it's gonna take me 80 hours to go through all these emails. And I was like, right, 80 hours versus jail time, which will not be 80 hours. Right, because I think that you had brought up, <clears throat> I think that you had brought up that, that this had happened, or either Barb did, that this had happened to someone in Watergate who refused um, uh, the subpoena and ended up sitting in jail, I think, for 18 months or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and that, that was Barbara, and, you know, she was absolutely right, and it, he just wasn't hearing it. He, 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 he was not thinking straight, to be quite blunt. I mean, because you don't, he was being very emotional. He was being very protective of Roger Stone. He, he expressed his fear for Roger Stone. And you could just see that he was not thinking it through, that he was being emotional. And, you know, he just, it, it, it was just very hard to sit there and not just say, dude, look, listen to yourself. Yeah. And you could kind of see the come to Jesus moment when it hit his face. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, it seemed like you did reach him on a more personal level. Like, why do you got this loyalty to Stone? Um, you know, when your your dad is worried about you, man. <laughs> well, and I, I think I literally said because he kept saying Roger Stone did nothing wrong, and my point was, well, if that's true, you really don't have any reason to put yourself in jeopardy. I mean, it, it, if what you're saying is true and you honestly believe that he did nothing wrong. First of all, you shouldn't ever cover up for someone who did something wrong, of course. But at the time, I just wanted him to see that if all the things he was saying was true, he had no argument, no reason to put himself in that kind of jeopardy. Now, obviously, I think he's wrong. <laughs> uh, I think Roger Stone had a lot to worry about. But his point was, he did nothing wrong, I'm not going. Uh, I'm protecting my mentor. It's clear they want, you know, Roger. And it was like, you're not making sense if if he did nothing wrong and you don't have any information that would suggest he did. Why are you going to risk jail time? But I think the point where he turned and the point you're referring to, A.G., was when it was towards the end and he kind of looked at me and said, wait, do you really think I'm going to go to jail? And I actually just looked at Ari like, where, where has he been this whole past 30 minutes? <laughs> Uh, you know, and but it, that was like the moment where it kind of all started appearing to sink in, you know, and then obviously he, he left and thought about it a lot more. And I'm I'm very grateful that he did. Yeah. And there could have been other factors at play, too. I mean, I don't mean to, you know, uh, contribute to the rumor mill, but I do believe he went on Aaron Burnett later that day and she smelled alcohol in his breath. So there could have been like mitigating circumstances uh, to his you know, mental capacity at that on that day. Yeah, I, I can make no comment on that. I have no idea. I, I just don't know. I will certainly say I didn't smell any alcohol, um, but I didn't wasn't close to him physically. I mean, I think you all saw the distance. Uh, we were never closer than that distance. He was on the other side of the table, you know, but for me, it really didn't. That wasn't the relevant point. It wasn't whether he was or wasn't. It was that here is someone who is making a very dangerous personal decision. And at a certain point you, and I won't say it was necessarily conscious. I just did what I thought was the right thing in the moment, which is just to try to get him to see what he was really setting himself up for. 
Yeah, and you you definitely did the right thing. You probably kept that guy out of jail, and uh, you know, you between you and Barbara, and and uh, I think that that's really great because I don't understand this loyalty to Stone, and this seems to be a pattern among Stone associates uh, with Corsi now. Um, you know, blowing up his, or not even blowing up his plea deal, but just not accepting it, releasing his draft plea agreement to the public. And then, of course, um, the Manhattan Madam was having issues with wanting to testify. And, and we, you know, we had Numberg, and I just don't know what it, it's going, what's going on in the Stone camp where these guys would be willing to risk their own freedom to support a guy like, who, a guy who's got Nixon tattooed on his back for all intents and purposes. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I actually think that Jerome Corsi has done the opposite of protect Roger Stone because he's publicly stated that Roger Stone told him to lie and to help, told him to help him cover up, uh, you know, what was very clear from those email exchanges, which was that Roger Stone was trying to get those emails that he believed WikiLeaks had. And if he were protecting Roger Stone, he certainly wouldn't have made those states, statements publicly. It made, uh, and of course, Roger Stone started publicly attacking Jerome Corsi. Uh, Roger Stone was not so friendly to Sam Nunberg either, as we know. So yeah. I wouldn't necessarily, but I say that to say that you're you're certainly right that people have expressed loyalty to Roger Stone, but I would not count Jerome Corsi among them. And by the way, no one should be loyal to the point of violating the law or protecting the violation of a law. Yeah. Or maybe he just doesn't understand how to protect someone. <laughs> I, well, I, I, I think the person that Jerome Corsi is trying to protect is Donald Trump. Uh, I don't think it's Roger Stone. I think if he were um, not trying to protect Donald Trump, he would be absolutely entering into an agreement to cooperate with Robert Mueller's team. Yeah, perhaps, um, perhaps that's the case. And then, you know, of course, we were going to ask you if you could possibly give Jerome, Jerry, a call and see if you could talk him into complying with the Mueller subpoena. But uh, <laughs> I don't know how well that would work. But what do you make of this uh, stepson? He, uh, do you, I feel like Mueller's putting the screws to his family to, to, to get him to cooperate. Well, I, I, I will, I will, I read that a little differently. Uh, I, uh, any prosecutor who has a witness, in this case, Jerome Corsi, who says, I didn't do anything wrong. I wasn't trying to destroy evidence, which would be obstruction of justice. <laughs> and it's a crime in and of itself. I wasn't doing that. This was just a routine family issue where I was dealing with a computer issue and so this was just a normal thing. And my stepson is a witness. The prosecutor absolutely must then go and talk to the witness to determine whether or not the story's true. So it doesn't start as, ooh, I'm going to go get your family member. <laughs> it starts as, oh, it starts as, okay, you're telling me that you have, that there's someone who will corroborate your version of this. And if that person corroborates that version, you still may have done something you shouldn't have done, but we won't have, uh, but, but, but there will be evidence that you didn't do it as a crime, that you didn't intend to destroy evidence. Now it's not very credible, but I'm just saying that that is the right thing to do because it's a fact finding mission. Now, certainly though, to your point, that certainly imperils the stepson, puts the stepson in a position where the stepson has a choice because if, if in fact Jerome Corsi destroyed evidence intentionally, meaning knew it was evidence, knew they were coming for it and was wiping it to protect Donald Trump, Roger Stone, whomever himself, the stepson now has to decide whether he's going to imperil himself because if he lies, <laughs> then he is subject to uh, 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 his own criminal investigation. Now, again, we don't know what, ro what evidence Robert Mueller's team has in addition to whatever Jerome Corsi is telling them. We suspect and should suspect he's got emails, obviously, he's got documents, and he's got, you know, wh who knows what witnesses who said who knows what. 
So we don't know, but I'm just saying that it does create the potential for what you say, which is if there was a crime committed here, it certainly gives them the opportunity to go after the stepson if the stepson lies. Yeah, so it's just a matter of chronology at this point. It's it's something Mueller has to follow um, as part of the investigation by following up with a witness that can either exculpate or not, uh, whatever Jerome Corsi is saying. And then in and of in and of itself, it's um, another tool that that Mueller has in his bag to um, try to get folks to cooperate. I mean, that's just generally how these things work. Absolutely. I just think it's important because there's been so much of an attack on this probe as biased that I think it is really important for the public to understand the normal course of an investigation would include talking to anyone who is identified as a witness with the intent to get to the truth, not with the intent to say, ooh, let's go find someone. But you know, I, I, it is important for people to know that that's the way it's done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today, everybody. Uh, professor of Public and Urban Policy and Legal Analyst for NBC, Maya Wiley. Maya, thanks for being on Mueller, she wrote. Thanks so much for having me. All right, guys, we now have an update. Um, we've waited for a long time to get an update on sex coach Nastia Ribka, and Jalisa will have that later for us in Hot Notes. Um, then midweek, the judge in the Manafort case asked the clerk, uh, on the court to unseal the redacted version of the evidence Mueller had to file under seal supporting his breach of plea filing. The breach of plea filing is the thing that said Manafort lied to us five times about these five things. Well, the judge wanted all the evidence, so he handed it all in under seal, and the, the judge said unseal it, and it included over 800 pages of pretty much totally redacted evidence <laughs> <laughs> proving that Manafort had lied about those five things. And in response, Manafort's team filed for an extension uh, to respond to the massive filing, saying, you know, can we maybe get our shit have together? Have a couple <laughs> days to read all this shit. Um, I mean, it's just crimes you committed. You should know it, but you know, um, they blacked out. They, they <laughs> literally redacted. They were <laughs> their brains were redacted. They were redacted drunk. Um, as for a due date, uh, it is now January twenty third. That's when um, they've asked for. Uh, the judge hasn't responded to this motion yet i'm assuming she'll grant it i mean it's 800 fucking pages and yeah. what's really funny that we learned that i didn't know is Mueller was handing in all this evidence and he goes this is 800 pages i got way more if you want it uh -huh. wow overachiever so, what a little fucking <laughs> nerd judge's pet right <laughs> yeah yeah here's an apple uh anyway yeah we haven't seen a response to that motion i'm sure it'll be granted we'll keep you posted um catch our midweek Wednesday night episode. Also, Mueller asked for an extension of two months in the Gates sentencing, citing that Gates is still cooperating in multiple open and ongoing investigations. We are still waiting for an answer to that motion, and we'll keep you posted. This is further indication that Mueller could be wrapping up by mid-March, but it seems too soon. Yeah, I agree. Hashtag too soon. Yeah. Um, also, Gates, has he been allowed to travel out of the country yet? Still no, right? No, I don't think so. I think yeah. he wanted to go somewhere. And yeah, he, I remember and that. Uh, and I think special counsel was like, probably not, bro. Yeah. I'm wondering like how on lock he is currently. It'd be interesting to know what his life is, a day in the life of Rick Gates. I'm sure he's free to travel if, if he gets permission um, from special counsel. I just don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, same. Yeah, we'll we'll figure out, you know. Why? When we get get into the nasty Ribka story, <laughs> exactly. And something about the the mid March deadline for the Mueller thing. It's if that happens, we can have another like Mueller madness thing going on there. If there's a lot of things that drop before then, <laughs> if there's a lot of things yeah, that drop, sweet yeah, sixteen of your favorite indictments. Yeah, <laughs> we could have so many though. We could have like ten sweet sixteens. So yeah, yeah. So many the same week as like the actual March madness would be really <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's gonna be like a uh, Infinity War when half the population just gets wiped out. And just <laughs> Half the criminals of the world, yeah, just disappear. <laughs> oh, we're going to need a whole new, like, criminal island. Oh, yeah, that's right. The White like a, Island. Like a, like a penal colony. <laughs> White <laughs> Island. That's true. They get banished to the White Island. Yeah. It's yeah. like the opposite of that Mormon prophecy or whatever when, like, <laughs> like <laughs> they just turn, like, black and they're, like, doomed. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that? They had a fun little cartoon that teaches children about that. Isn't that great? Good times. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. If you're a Mormon and you have issues with that, prove us wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll baptize in dead people. Weird city. Oh, yeah. I don't. Please don't baptize me. <laughs> when That's I'm why dead. you guys have to freeze my head. It's a fair request. <laughs> <laughs> That's my only last will and testament. I have, being of sound mind, wish to not be baptized in the Mormon church. Thank you. <laughs> uh, also, Tuesday, we learned that Peter Baker, 
No, not Peter Baker. Who's Peter Baker? It's James Baker. Look, I fixed it so we don't have to have a correction yeah. for next week. Fact checking in real time. Uh, he's one of the Comey Five. He's now under criminal investigation for leaks by the Republicans in the House Oversight Committee. So they're still trying to with their little investigations. Isn't that cute? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, good luck getting a subpoena, assholes. <laughs> Uh, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. As you know, if you're a longtime listener to Mueller, she wrote, the Comey Five is what we refer to as the five high-level FBI officials that Comey shared his contemporaneous notes about his meetings with Trump with, right? Mm -hmm. And we were all, oh, shit, these guys are in trouble. They've got targets on their back. Trump's going to fuck them over. Uh, Those were Bowditch, McCabe, Baker, Gaddis, and Rybicki. Or Rybicki. (laughs) Rybicki. Rybicki. We added a sixth Bente or Buente. Um, we added him because like, he's like an honorary Comey Five. Yeah, yeah. Um, over a year ago, we told you guys, we told you to watch these guys because Trump would try to pick them off one by one and discredit them. And all of them have now either been fired or pushed out or have retired. And now Baker is under a bullshit house investigation for leaking. Uh, they'll find nothing. Put some beans on it. Don't worry about it. Right. Baker's legit. Then 11 Republicans broke rank with Trump and voted to block Trump from lifting sanctions on Oleg Deripaska. He's the aluminum magnate, Russian oligarch, super good friends with Putin. Uh, And this was a procedural vote, though it did not pass the second vote, and therefore Trump will presumably lift sanctions on Deripaska in a likely squid pro quo for Putin. Probably one of the topics that was covered in the Helsinki summit, uh, along with the NATO pullout. What a piece of shit. Those are all beans. I don't know. He ate his notes, so I don't know if that's (laughs) actually what happened. Didn't we have a thing where he was eating his notes? Yeah, that was a thing. It was. It was a thing. Yeah. He was eating his notes. I I don't know if he ate these notes, but he confiscated them. Growing boy. These notes sounds like these nuts. These notes? (laughs) Eat these nuts. (laughs) These nuts, dim gavels. (laughs) Dim gavels, though. Put them in your mouth. Uh, Still Tuesday, Mueller will likely restrict some of what Cohen will testify to, according to a report in the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Cohen, Michael Cohen, he is scheduled to speak to the House Oversight Committee on February 7th. Um, he will likely not be allowed to discuss topics he's covered with special counsel Robert Mueller, according to a source close to Cohen. I don't think this will stop millions of people from watching it. Uh, I think he can be asked about the BuzzFeed news reporting. Uh, he did tweet after that, and we'll go over this a little bit, you know, about the BuzzFeed report in case you haven't heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he did tweet out that he was directed to lie to Congress. Um, he tweeted, Michael Cohen tweeted that after the BuzzFeed story came out. And uh, I think he should be able to answer questions on that. It is part of a Mueller investigation, but it's not. it might or might not be something he discussed with Mueller. I'm not quite sure, but it's in his sentencing memo right. that he was directed to do this. And he's tweeted it out, so I'm not sure. Where the line is there. I don't think it would be a restricted topic since he's already it's already out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder. Comey Singh, uh, his questioning television moment of fame that <laughs> that was still interesting even though he had to deny answering a lot of the questions so i imagine it'll be similar to that mm-hmm. yeah yeah whatever we can get out of cohen would be better than nothing right i just hope he talks like this and with a plaid suit <laughs> <laughs> i love the plaid suit <laughs> plaid nice suit. comey has a real um subtle plaid jacket much mm-hmm. nicer that's right when he wears with his brown shoes mm-hmm. oh. <laughs> you know it's all outfit <laughs> Also Wednesday, Kaludi Rudy had a revelatory interview with Cohen. With Cohen. Cuomo. Cuomo. <laughs> <laughs> my my autocorrect, I don't use Cuomo as much as I use Cohen. That makes sense, yeah. Cuomo. I'm going to correct it in my notes. Uh, and Jordan, you're going to cover this. Yes. In hot notes. This was really good. Yeah. Classic Giuliani. <laughs> totally classic. I could have written it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he really could. Yeah, How myself. is he not fired yet? That is the question I keep asking Oh, myself. he's doing his job. I think he's doing his job. <laughs> I think I'm with yeah, you, Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. But yeah. I'm 100% with you. There's other that. things in that interview that I feel are also just sort of like bad press. Because <laughs> if you think about shit that Trump says in interviews, like where he absolutely and totally implicates himself in suborning perjury and witness tampering, he probably thinks whatever Rudy's doing is awesome. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why are you guys mad? It's awesome. They're kindred spirits for sure. Yeah. Oh, fuck. All prob- right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, they're probably already investing in like technology so that they can smuggle into jail to break out of or something. Oh, yeah. They got a guy. <laughs> yeah. They're <laughs> yeah. just a long game couple. You oh, know? Yeah. Oh, they yeah. know. They know what's coming. Yeah, but they're using, like, Windows 95 to do it. (laughs) 
I love the little maze that came with the screensaver. You guys remember that? Oh, Old oh, school, yeah. man. Shout out to pipes. the brick maze. Yeah, the pipes too. Pipes was yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, <laughs> badass Nancy Pelosi wrote a letter to Trump telling him she's not going to let him give his State of the Union address to Congress like normal, citing the government shutdown, saying that Department of Homeland Security won't be able to provide the necessary security for the event. I mean, if you think about it, everybody's going to be there. You've got the judges, the chiefs of staff, um, the SCOTUS judges, when I say judges, mm-hmm. not just like Mike Judge. Um, they'll <laughs> all be there. All the Congress people will be there. All the cabinet members will be there, except for one called the designated survivor. That's I, right. I don't know who it is. There's a show for it. In on case TV. someone bombs the whole. Jesus, that's bleak. Yeah, that's I didn't exactly know that was a thing. And exactly they rotate the position, right? Like they different do. people. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you draw straws. There's some probably some more weird, like yeah. old man. <laughs> Like yeah, like Skull tradition. Society, blood dripping, Odd George fellows. Bush thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, don't cut my hand. Yeah. <laughs> we must. The designated survivor must <laughs> shed blood. But what about, never mind. No wonder it's a TV show. That is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. It is. And it, what was really great is in the designated, sur- oh, I can't tell you. Spoilers. Why I love it. First of all, I'll spoil it. And I also might give away my. Oh, agency. okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. I haven't seen it yet. It's really, it's pretty good. I, 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 like, the first two seasons were amazing, and then it started to get wonky, but I love it, and I love the concept of, I mean, I don't love the concept of everybody dying, uh, but, It's like, just, like, very, uh, It's spooky, right? Yeah. There's one guy in a basement somewhere else, you know, hidden, whisked away from the Capitol building in case, boom, bomb, happens. And then it happens, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And he would be the president. They'd have to Jeez. put the country back together again. Mm-hmm. Fuck. And it, it could be, like, fucking, it could be Ben Carson. Oh no! And this is for all major events, or just for the State of the Union State of the Union address that pulls together a specific body? I think it's just for the State of the Union address. Interesting. Because I think the State of the Union address is the only one that has all those people present in the same building. Right, mm-hmm. right. They could just stop having the State of the Union. <gasps> it is kind of boring. <laughs> it solves that whole bleak hellscape yeah. scenario. Just, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tradition. Yeah, know? yeah. Of course. I so, watch it every paper time. Paper isn't good enough. Come on. <laughs> it's a dying what, industry. That's what fucking. Political Lucy said, she's like, you can write it down if you want mm-hmm. or give it in the Oval Office. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. He can't write. Um, <laughs> this pissed Trump off, and he retaliated by not providing a government plane for her and a contingency of staffers to visit a war zone, Af- Afghanistan, I believe, saying that, is it Afghanistan? It was Afghanistan, and then they had a mandatory stop in Brussels, but he wanted to list that out as if it was a destination in itself. Yeah, so Afghanistan and a couple other spots, a couple other stops they have to make. Um Yes, destination wedding. No, <laughs> um, war zone. And you're not supposed to say that people are going. Um, and Because he was like, you can take a commercial jet if you like. Well, she can't now because it's out in the public that this contingency of very high level people are going to a war zone. So now you can't. Right. Stupid, dumb piece of shit. Yep. <laughs> and that was his little, uh, oh, well, I'm taking your plane away. He's so petty. And then oddly, though, immediately he let Melania use the government plane and staff to fly to Mar-a-Lago even though the government shut down. So what's your excuse there, mm-hmm. sir? Oh, he's such a baby. It, it hurt to call him sir. Don't let me do yeah, that it doesn't again. feel right. <laughs> yeah, even if it is patronizing. Yeah. <laughs> sir, put a little stank on it. Sir. Yeah. sir. <laughs> put the fart noise. It's good. Uh, Thursday, Nastya Rybko was arrested, manhandled in Moscow after being promised safe passage to Belarus after being released from the Thai prison that she was in for the last m- many months. And Jaleesa will have that for us later in the show. Moving on to Thursday, when we learned that the law firm, Skadden, Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom. Let me do that again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Skadden, Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom. I just love saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it in ep- episode 46, too. Uh, they agreed to pay a settlement of $4.5 million in a case tied to Manafort. If you remember from episode 46, go back, have a listen. We reported that Greg Craig, he's a Democrat, and he's a lobbyist, and he could be under criminal investigation for lobbying on behalf of Ukraine without registering under the... Uh, Registration Act, Farah, And he worked for Skadden. And you'll also recognize the Skadden law firm as the one that Vanderswan, whose father-in-law is Herman German German Khan of Alpha Bank fame, um, he asked Skadden to write that whitewashed report about Yanukovych's opponent, Tymoshenko. Yanukovych is the guy Manafort worked for, as you know. And as a part of this settlement, Skadden will have to retroactively register as a foreign agent. They're getting really good at retroactively registering mm-hmm. as foreign agents. Um just everyone on that whole side. And Greg Craig, a Democrat. I will support prosecuting Democrats who violate oh, the law. Definitely. Uh, that's what sets us apart. <laughs> from, from, from a GOP. From yeah. A GOP. They're coming around a little bit, to be fair. That's true. Slowly with the nationalist stuff. Yeah, yeah. So 
<laughs> so they have to pay four point five million dollars in restitution, which is nothing for a firm that makes two point five billion dollars a year. Um, we still don't know if they're going to file criminal charges against Greg Craig uh, for his work at the firm. We'll find out. I'll let you know. I'll cheers to anybody going down for breaking the law. Fuck that guy. Mm-hmm. Great name though, Greg Craig. Greg Craig gets green gators. Good grappa. <laughs> it's a it's, it's a yeah. good tongue twister. <laughs> like my first book or something. Yeah. <laughs> I like it because it's two first names. That's always fun. Greg Craig. Yeah. <laughs> you say it so fast. Mm. Greg Craig. Greg Craig. Uh, <laughs> then a really weird story came out Thursday. I, I know. Really weird stories. Uh, Cohen paid a guy to rig drudge polls to make Trump seem more popular than he was in the lead up to the election. Or in the election, the lead up to the election. The weird part is that he paid this guy $13,000 in cash along with a boxing glove signed by some MMA guy, and he handed it all over in a blue Walmart bag. <laughs> this is the level of class we're dealing with. He's probably wearing his plaid jacket. He's probably having a cigar out on the stoop with the fellas. <laughs> Hand over this Walmart bag. Shops at Walmart. Yeah. Uh, the total payoff was 50000 13000 and then I guess a $27,000 boxing glove. <laughs> and later, Cohen asked Trump for the $50,000 back, right? Of course... It is totally legal to give your own campaign money as long as you report it, which Trump did not. So now he is possibly facing three campaign finance felonies. Wow. Oh, okay, but also what about the idea of misconstruing poll data? Is that allowed? I don't know. I, I think it's an impeachable offense. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's illegal. Because they weren't thinking someone would do that at that level, probably. <laughs> they well, even if they law. do, if you get somebody to fudge poll numbers is that illegal yeah I think it well i mean be. conceivably yeah. it could definitely affect the psychology of the electorate if you see someone with higher polling numbers and have more confidence in them mm-hmm. maybe it's yeah, like fake news you can impeach you. one of the articles of impeachment for nixon was lying to the public misleading the public and that could be con- yeah. considered that i oh, would yeah. throw it into the massive giant right. pile Propaganda. of articles of impeachment if you know that we already have but that, i think that that's would qualify as that but i don't know if it's technically illegal i know it's illegal to donate to your own campaign make an in-kind campaign contribution without reporting Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. so that is a felony then of course thursday night we got that buzzfeed report with a headline that trump directed cohen to lie to congress about the trump tower moscow timeline and the Mueller reboot (laughs) rebuke rebuki the Mueller rebuke that came out right after that well the day after um, of that report saying it's not accurate and i'll go over all that in hot notes in detail so guys those are the facts this week Big week. Oh, yeah. Crazy week. We'll be right back. Hey, Muller junkies. Muller She Wrote is brought to you by Buffy. Who is Buffy? Buffy makes comforters that are better for you and the earth using skin-friendly eucalyptus fabric and fluffy fill made from 100% recycled water bottles. I love this. I love this idea. You know how big we are into sustainability on this show. And this comforter has over 11,000 reviews. Everybody agrees it's the softest, fluffiest comforter. And it's made from all plant-based fabric and it's super breathable. It keeps you cool when it's, you know, when it's hot out and it keeps you warm when it's cold. Uh, The outside shell is 100% eucalyptus fiber. It's unique. It's softer than cotton. It soothes your skin. It's really wonderful. In addition to being softer than cotton, eucalyptus fiber is much less wasteful. It's made from a renewable plant, 10 times less water to cultivate this, and it's produced in a closed-loop system that reuses 99% of its solvents. This comforter is also hypoallergenic. Buffy's thoughtful materials and construction shuts out dust, mold, and mites, preventing nighttime breathing of harmful allergens. So that's really nice, too. Buffy's mission is to make the best soft goods using sustainable materials and innovative design without animal cruelty or harmful waste. The inside fill is 100% BPA water bottles, recycled, transformed, given a second life as a soft and delicious comforter. It feels softer than down while keeping about 50 bottles out of landfills and oceans. And after one year, Buffy has recycled and used reused over 3.5 million water bottles, you guys. So I have this comforter. I absolutely love it. I am a hot sleeper, and I love it because it keeps me cool at night. I don't sweat. It's so soft, and it really is. I When I was like, it's soothing to your skin, it actually is. It's totally, they're reinventing this whole game with this 100% fill made with plastic water bottles. I absolutely love it. For $20 off your Buffy comforter, visit Buffy.co and enter promo code AG. That's right. Our listeners are going to get $20 off this incredible comforter. That's Buffy.co and use promo code AG. AG for twenty dollars off today. You'll be glad you did. All right, welcome back. Hot notes. 
All right, guys, welcome back. Don't forget, ad free episodes, become a patron. Patreon.com slash Uh uh. Uh, okay, so today, Jordan, you have the Kaludi Rudy interview. But first, Jaleesa, you have an update on Nastia Ribka. On Tuesday, the Washington Post reported that Nastia Ribka pleaded guilty in Thailand to teaching sex seminars and was sentenced to immediate deportation. And then on Thursday, we learned from The Guardian that as soon as Nastia Ribka arrived at the Moscow airport for safe passage, she immediately was arrested. And basically, I feel like she's going to be tortured and killed. I think she'll be murdered. Yeah. I mean, Um, that's what they do. Yeah. We got a lot of questions about that. Uh, And it doesn't I don't think it looks good. And it's terrifying. And horrible that they would promise her safe passage through moscow to belarus Mm -hmm. and then while she's changing planes they told her she have to change planes in moscow it's like she had to be like really bro that's we need to and then she was she was just immediately detained and they yeah they it was pretty rough too it wasn't yeah it wasn't peaceful at all they took pardon me Mm ma'am will you come with us yeah yeah very clear they took four of the seven people that came from thailand with her and they're facing up to six years in prison so in in russia russian prison yeah I'm wondering, is there any sort of higher, like the UN or something that could maybe try to step in at all? Because with Khashoggi, for example, I don't think people saw that coming at all. They didn't know that they didn't have intelligence that he was coming into that consulate and that something might happen to him. But this is so blatantly obvious that she has a target on her back. It's like, is there anyone that can step in at all? I don't know. Um, I really don't. Yeah. Uh, I know that our FBI went to Thailand to try to talk to her and, and, and she couldn't like, get access to She her. backtracked her story, too, which can't help her case for being rescued, too. Saying that only Deripaska could have the vid- like, Exactly, that they worked out a Deripaska deal. Deripaska gets them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't yeah. think. I think Mueller would have seen through that. That was probably something that she was forced to say. Uh, uh, yeah, that makes and, sense. And, and, and that's why Mueller, I think that's why they sent some FBI agents over there to try to get access to her. I don't, they, but they weren't allowed access. Oh, yeah, they were just turned away? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine she would speak up if she could, if she had the platform. Yeah, well, we'll keep uh, an eye on the story. I don't know that we're going to hear much more about it, honestly. Yeah, I, I hope they tell us something, regardless of what happens, as awful as the outcome could be. I hope we just know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that reporting. It's scary. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you. That is. Jordan, what do you got? All right, so... Uh, the mouth shitter is back this week. We miss you, Guliani. Um, <laughs> thank you for opening your mouth again because it just keeps getting better, really. In a CNN interview with Chris Cuomo on CNN Wednesday this week, Giuliani went on national television for another installment of the Loop the Truth tour and told the nation that he never said members of Trump's campaign did not collude with Russia. He only said that the president himself didn't. And Cuomo's like, yeah, you did. Right. Roll yeah. the tape. That was good. That was, I watched that. Cuomo was good in that interview. He he was calling him out. Like he's like, "No, you you did. You yes. said no one did." I mean, at this point too, the people interviewing him have to know what's coming. He's going to say some shit that is entirely antithetical to what he said. So they're like, "Let's just look back at what he said. Just screenshot yeah. it all. Just have, we'll it, have it ready up. to go." Yeah, <laughs> we're ready to go when he opens his mouth. I have to say that I loved the response on Twitter when uh Cuomo put that out, CNN put that out, Joyce uh, White Vance put that out. Wouldn't it, CNN? Yeah. CNN, yeah. yeah, yeah. And everybody was like tagged us in it. They're like, oh, uh-huh. lube in the truth. Look, Mueller, she writes, yeah. lube the truth. Yeah. Lube the truth. Mueller, she wrote, calls us lube in the truth. I'm like, Mueller oh, junkies are on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. <laughs> uh, Giuliani, he said, he said this exact quote. There is not a single bit of evidence uh, that the president of the United States committed the only crime that you can commit here, conspiring with the Russians to hack the DNC, end quote. Uh, there are many more crimes that one can commit here, <laughs> and by one I mean Trump. There's the hacking of the DNC, sure. There's, in coordination with Russia, there's the easing and non-enforcement of sanctions. There are other kickbacks for days. The list really goes on and on and on, so that's hilarious to At me. he didn't say collusion for a change. Yes. Oh, yeah. Interesting He put that one lesson. in bed for a second, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this recent Lube the Truth attempt, of course, comes after we learned that Manafort was sharing internal polling data with Kalimnik and others very close to the Kremlin, thus really hammering those nails into Manafort's gout coffin. Uh, gout he- coffin. <laughs> That's that amazing. like a band. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna go see gout coffin with the tide. <laughs> yeah. Pretty awesome. Yeah, well, because th- this news comes out, right? And then, of course, Trump's response is, well, I didn't know he was doing that. This is the first time I'm learning of them sharing that sort of information. And he said that, uh, Giuliani said of Trump, well, Manafort did it. Trump didn't do it, which, as Watergate showed us, does not work as an excuse for people in your camp committing crimes that you were aware of. I guess the aware of part is TBD here, but <laughs> I would not be surprised at all. 
and I'm putting my beans on it for sure, <laughs> obviously, or else what are we doing here? Um, <laughs> what are we doing if not putting beans on Yeah, what, what are we doing? Even better, this interview is a total betrayal of the previous position we've heard from the Trump team, and that is the position that no one on their team ever colluded with the Russians. In fact, CNN did the numbers and identified 13 times that Trump tweeted that there was no collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. Trump campaign. Right. Not Trump. Right. Trump yeah. campaign, which is exactly what Giuliani used in this interview, was the Trump campaign is the one that colluded. So there we go. There's just one fun contradiction for <laughs> you that's blatantly out there. Uh, so which is it, Giuliani? Uh, I think it's the one where you all go to jail. Uh, <laughs> Giuliani then in the interview directly calls out Mueller. This is one of my favorite parts, challenging Mueller to find any wrongdoing committed by the president. Already on it, buddy. Thanks. Yeah, I got a memo saying I was supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a couple good. Years ago. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Now with your CNN blessing, I appreciate I your permission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Giuliani said, "Quote: Let's see if he's got anything. I challenge him to show us some evidence that the president was involved in anything approaching criminal conduct." End quote. I feel like at this point, that's just a serious question. Like, Giuliani's actually asking, like, please, can you tell me what has he done? I don't, even know. I don't even know me. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's like, I dare you. And yeah. then call me and let me know. <laughs> yeah. Because I cannot keep track of my notes. <laughs> can I get your notes? Getting convoluted. Yeah. <laughs> Do you teach a learning annex class on what's illegal? Because I should take that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Giuliani. Julie. Aw, that's probably his nickname as a kid. That's cute. Or what he got mocked incessantly for. <laughs> Julie. Uh, Giuliani in the interview also corrected his previous statements that week that seemed to suggest that he thinks Trump's legal team should get to edit Mueller's report before it's released. He clarified in this interview that he said they think they should at least get to see it, and that is all. Um, while also happening to wear Google Glasses that have a copy and paste function. <laughs> yeah, I dare you to try to reformat a document. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Republicans. Yeah. Go so, for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, damn it. They put it in PDF. What do we do? <laughs> no. Foiled. Can we get Manafort to convert it to Word? No, fall back. Fall back. <laughs> fall back. Fall back. Fall back. Run away. Yeah. <laughs> Who created this thing? <laughs> PDFs. So, um, yeah. I mean, that that's, that's one of the more, I think, considering the news cycle this week that last part is pretty consequential because everyone was pretty up in arms about that and he's like no 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 we're not saying that we're just saying we should be able to see it before but nothing he says means anything anymore so yeah yeah, yeah. i just have one thing to say to kaludi rudy order 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 i love that guy so much <laughs> he's so adorable order <laughs> No one made me my video. I Aww. asked if somebody could make me a video mashup of Hodor saying order, order. <laughs> it's probably harder, man. Or of John Burkow saying Hodor. Oh, that one seems doable. <laughs> that would yeah. be great. Too. That'd probably be easier. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> order. Uh, we spoke uh, this week with one of my favorite people to talk about my hot note. Let's listen to that interview. All right, guys. So late Thursday, BuzzFeed published a story with the headline, quote, President Trump directed his attorney, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress about the Moscow Trump Tower project. Uh, and that story was all anyone was talking about all day Friday until Peter Carr, spokesperson for special counsel's office, notoriously quiet fellow, put out a very rare statement saying that the story um, but he, he said, quote, BuzzFeed's description of specific statements to the special counsel's office and characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Michael Cohen's congressional testimony are not accurate, unquote. And BuzzFeed's editor in chief came out saying that he stands behind the reporting and asked special counsel to please explain or clarify what part of the reporting wasn't accurate. And joining us to talk about this is staff writer for The Atlantic and MSNBC contributor Natasha Bertrand. Natasha, welcome back to Mueller, she wrote. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. So what's the deal, yo? <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, obviously this was a really bombshell moment. Special counsel's office literally never responds to anything, let alone disputes a report. We've never actually seen that happen before. Um, you know, I think it was like, I think it was a combination of things. Um, the first was that I don't know how clearly the reporters laid out to the special counsel when they were requesting comment, um, what they were actually going to report. Um, it's my understanding that 
you know, the report says that Mueller's office obtained documents and, and testimony that corroborates certain aspects of Michael Cohen's testimony in which he said that my, that Donald Trump told him to lie. And it's also, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's something that the special counsel was made aware of so that they would be able to reply to it, you know, on, on the day. Um, so after the story came out, there was a lot of talk about impeachment. Democrats were kind of you know, drawing blood, smelling blood. They were saying we're going to, you know, start impeachment proceedings if this is true, because it is a felony. Fast forward and, and Mueller's office sees the report and is like, wait, um, you know, this is this leak. It looks kind of like it came from our office because there are just so many details here about, you know, Mueller's and what Mueller has. Um, so I think that was part of it. I, I do think that Another big part of it is probably just to protect the integrity of the investigation. I mean, this is an extremely big deal. And if Congress were to start launching impeachment proceedings based on a report that was even slightly inaccurate, um, then I think that that would probably prompt Mueller's team to to step in. Um, But again, like they parsed their statement very quickly, very carefully. They didn't say that it was completely wrong or that Busby was lying. They just said that parts of it were characterized um, or or the characterization of it just was not accurate. What that means, that is, of course, that remains to be seen. BuzzFeed now is trying to get answers, apparently, and they are going back to their sources and they are asking for more information. So, you know, the story is moving very quickly. I think we just need to keep an eye on it um, over the next few days. I got you. So so the quote unquote green light um, where BuzzFeed sent their reporting to special counsel's office, um, apparently they had no comment on that. And that's what they perceived as the go ahead to publish. They they got a so it was a no comment. um, And this was provided to me by the communications director when I asked for more clarity about the back and forth. It was a no comment. And then the special counsel's office followed up about five minutes later in another email saying, just want to make sure you have this. And what they did was they copied and pasted essentially parts of Michael Cohen's plea agreement in which he says that, you know, he lied out of a blind loyalty to Donald Trump and that, you know, this was basically at, you know, at Trump's directive and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so BuzzFeed took that as, you know, they didn't say this is, you know, confirmation or denial, but they didn't take it as, you know, they weren't waving them off the story. But based on the question that the reporters asked the special counsel, I don't know whether the special counsel had all of the information that they would have needed to provide a full and, and thorough response before the story was actually published. Yeah. And to me, that's actually kind of the story um, that the unintended story that's come out uh, that I think that I'm like, wow, is because it made me go back and look at that Cohen sentencing memo from Cohen's defense team, where it said that both the false statements made to Congress and the payment, you know, the Stormy Daniels thing uh, were both at the directive of client one or individual one being Trump in this case, which means we this has been in the public or at least the the you know the gist of the story the headline of the story that that Trump directed him to lie to Congress has been in the public court documents now for 2 months right exactly and and we've known that Michael Cohen was in direct contact with members of the White House legal team if not with Trump himself because that is something that Michael Cohen's lawyers actually admitted in their own um court documents, they said that not only was he feeling the pressure, but he was also working with the White House legal team on crafting his um, prepared testimony before he went before Congress. So, you know, I think that that this is this is honestly a distinction without a difference. I mean, the White House and therefore Trump were clearly in the loop when Michael Cohen was drafting the statement and they clearly wanted to hide the fact that he was pursuing a deal in in Russia because Trump did not tell anyone in 2016 that he was trying to make this deal happen. Um, So I think that is the big picture here that we need to stay focused on is that Trump lied. It's not even just that he, you know, yes, if, if he told Michael Cohen to lie, that is obviously a felony. And that's a very serious crime that Democrats, for example, if they wanted to, could latch on to if they had hard proof and say this is an impeachable offense. But he also lied to the American people when he said that he had no business dealings in Russia and when he concealed the fact that he was pursuing a multimillion dollar real estate th- deal there in 2016. Yeah. And we know from history that you can uh, be impeached uh, for lying to the public. It was a I think, I think one of the articles of impeachment for Nixon. Right, exactly. Um, it, you know, obstruction of justice, witness tampering. These are all things that could that could 
realistically be used by Democrats um, to begin impeachment proceedings. Now, I, I wrote about this yesterday. It seems like now they're not going to wait for Mueller's final report, if need be, um, in order to start holding the president accountable. Um, but of course, you know, they also don't want to get out too far ahead of Mueller because that would just be really anticlimactic and the public would be left wondering, well, you know, what does the special counsel report say? Yeah, exactly. I, I think it would personally be smart to wait until you have uh, that, at least the bulk of the Mueller report uh, before you move forward with that. So you just have everything on the table at once. And uh, I know... Exactly. I know Rosenberg appeared on MSNBC the uh, Friday night and was talking about, you know, why did, you know, Mueller even charge Cohen with this? And, and they were positing that it was creating a predicate to charge others with the same offense. So it's not in and of itself an unimportant thing. Right. Exactly. I, and I think that when you put all of the lies together, I'm sorry if it just got a little bit louder. I'm, I'm on the street right now. Um, but if you put all of these lies together, they start to create a picture of, you know, conspiracy and concealment that you just really can't ignore. I mean, why was there such a concerted effort to work with the Russians in 2016? Why was there such a concerted effort by, you know, Michael Cohen, Donald Trump, Donald Trump Jr., um, you know, Michael Flynn to hide their conversations with the Russians? I mean, it's all it's it all adds to the emerging picture of some kind of conspiracy. Yeah, and the the DNC laid it out pretty great in their recent 111 page filing of, you know, I guess they're suing uh, all those guys. <laughs> right, right. I actually did not get a chance to read that, so I'm not in the best position to comment on it, but but yeah, I mean the DNC is essentially alleging that they um, stole the election and that they cheated to win. Yeah, it's pretty good. There's nothing really new that pops out in it. Um for us, you know, uh, I'll probably go over it in a mini sode. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about this today. Any last thoughts on on how we should mentally move forward from this? Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we should just keep in mind the, the big picture here, which is that the president was clearly compromised by Russia at a moment when Russia was attacking the election and trying to elect him. <laughs> So, yeah, and, so. and he's eating his notes from his meetings. Right, so. that too, of course. <laughs> we have to be careful of that. Hopefully the Attorney General actually knows what the Presidential Records Act is uh, so, yeah. so we can get some closure on that. All right, well, thank you so much, staff writer for The Atlantic, MSNBC contributor, and Natasha Bertrand. Thanks so much for being on Mueller, She Wrote. Thank you. So there you have it. That's my hot note. We need to remember, though, that uh, the special counsel's rebuke of the BuzzFeed report is not all-encompassing and only takes issue with part of the reporting, though we don't know which part. <laughs> uh, I think, and these are super space beans, but I think Mueller felt the need to comment publicly because of the leak. Um, yeah, lots of folks um, could have been under the impression that the SCO leaked, that's the special counsel's office, or even that Southern District of New York leaked. Um, but I spoke to Mimi Roca, who said that it, that's likely not it either. She's like, if you think that the Southern District of New York leaked, you don't know these people. So... You know, I don't know who these two law enforcement officials are. I've heard some pretty good sourced stuff that I'm not allowed to tell you, and I will tell you as soon as I can, but for now, haha. -ha. <laughs> um, there's a lot of off-the-record partial explanations floating around, and I don't want to get into those until the story has time to breathe. You know what I mean? And I think that's the main takeaway here uh, and why we do a midweek update and not smaller emergency sodes, uh, because we want to give these reports time to marinate so we can rely on incredible journalists like Natasha Bertrand and others who will get to the bottom of things for us. Um, tune in Wednesday for an update on this, and you'll notice uh, in that interview I also mentioned a 111-page lawsuit filed by the DNC uh, alleging Trump, his cronies, and the Russians conspired to steal the election. 13 counts of conspiracy, RICO, and all that other stuff, mm -hmm. racketeering, everything. It's a really interesting read. Um, we'll try to put it together in a minisode for you in the next week or two. But in the meantime, I recommend picking it up and checking it out. It's a really nice summary of the conspiracy. 111 pages. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really nice. It does it in numbers. Like, here's point one, point two, point three. Here's the crimes that were committed and by whom. And thank you. We're the DNC. Good night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> yeah. Good night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll be right back. Hey, Muller Junkies, it's 2019, which means a new year, new you. And for most people, that also means wanting to avoid overcrowded gyms. Do not abandon your New Year's resolution by February because old habits die hard, guys. So what I want you to do right now is get online and try Beachbody On Demand. Beachbody On Demand, it's easy to use. It's a streaming service. It gives you instant access to a wide variety, huge variety of really effective workouts you can do from the comfort of your own home. 24-7, right? So, like, check this out. They've got 
everything that you've always already heard of, like P90X, Insanity, Insanity Max 30, 21 Day Fix, T25, Focus T25, the Brazil Butt Lift, yeah, Pio, uh, Hip Hop Abs, Three Week Yoga Retreat, they have everything, every every workout from Beachbody, all in one little place, and I absolutely love it, they have the best trainers, they have Sean T, Charlene Johnson, Tony Horton, Autumn Calabrese, just absolutely it, like everyone all in one spot it's super fantastic hundreds of effective workouts all fitness levels seriously all fitness levels ranging from bodybuilding to weight training and cardio high intensity interval training yoga even dance workouts super fun um, in the time it takes you to drive and park at the gym you'll be done working out i swear to god i do the t25 it's my favorite it's 25 minutes a day sean t he's badass i love that guy over a million people currently use beach body on demand the thing that I love the most about it is, especially with all the travel that we do with the podcast, I can just take this, pop it in in the hotel room, at, it's on, on demand, so I don't have to bring my little DVD player to do my, you know, my DVD workouts, and I just do it right in the hotel room, 25 minutes, bam, done. I absolutely love it. All right, so check it out. What I want you to do is to start a program with me. I want you to try the T25. That's my personal favorite. Or, you know, if you prefer something more low impact, get on it and then at me at Muller She Wrote and just show me your progress. I'm really interested in it. And you can get a special free trial membership now. Just the Muller Junkins here. That's it, including their new 14-day results plan where you can lose up to nine pounds in the first two weeks. So what you do is you need to text AG to 303030. That's AG to 303030. You'll get full access to the entire platform for free. All the workouts, the nutrition information, the results plan to get super fast results, totally free. Keep your New Year's resolution going. Work out from the comfort of your own home or your hotel room 24 seven, you guys. Again, text AG to 303030. You'll be glad you did. All right, are you guys ready to play the Fantasy Indictment League? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> All right, this week, uh, Jaleesa, you're going to pick first, and then me, and then Jordan. So, Jaleesa, who was your first pick? Don't you dare say stone. I'm going to go with Corsi, actually. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, plea agreement or straight up indictment? Oh, straight up. All right. <laughs> Jaleesa. Corsi. All right, you got Corsi. I got Stone. Sorry. Got <laughs> no, it's fair. Um, let's just round out the camp. Assange. Nice. Nice. Jaleesa? Ooh, Eric Prince. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go with Junior. All right, I'm going to do a... Uh, this is a throwback. What's up with Credico? Good question. Yeah, nice. I'm going to do a Credico plea agreement. All right. From the way back times. <laughs> All right, Julissa. Uh, I'm going to do Kush. We haven't done Kush yet, right? No, we haven't done Kush. Cool. I'll do Ivanka then. Oh, yeah, get the big boys. Did someone oh, sorry, say woman. DTJ? No. Uh, I have Junior. Oh, oh that's right. fuck. All right. Um, <laughs> when nobody's got an Eric, though, yeah, I always pick last. Uh, mm. I'll take Tiffany before that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's do. Uh, I'll do a rando for this round. I'll do Eric Sin. Oh, Eric Sin. Yes. I'm a, who's Eric Sin? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. <clears throat> hmm. Superseding Manafort to God damn it. That's a good one. <laughs> I was going to do that. Yeah. Why did I do a random? What a fool. <laughs> All right. What a fool. <laughs> <laughs> what a fool. Okay, Vessel Nitskaya. Yeah, that's good. Straight up indictment? Plea agreement. Oh, straight up indictment. She's not fucking cooperating with shit. Mm-mm, she's right or die. <laughs> and die is also <laughs> probably very right likely. What? That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, JJ, you got one more. Yeah, let's see what's up with this Greg Craig guy. Good one. Good call. Let's see. Stone Jr. Ivanka. Mana. Mana, mana. Uh, <laughs> I'll do a rando. All right. Okay. All right. I'm going to do... Another throwback, uh, Rora Bakker. Mm. That's good. All right, well, I think we're done. 
All right. So, uh, J. Joe, you got Corsi, Prince, Kush, Erickson, and Greg Craig. Mm hmm. Uh, I've got Stone Jr., Ivanka, uh, Super CD Manafort, and Rando, and Jordan, Joko. You have Assange, Credico, Rando, Vazelnutskaya, and Dana. Nice. There is no Dana, only Zul. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys ready for sabotage? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Hey, y'all. <laughs> All right, just a little while ago, just a little while ago today, Politico reported that Trump has thanked Robert Mueller, praising special counsel for disputing the characterization of some aspects of the BuzzFeed news reporting, although that's not what he said. Um, lots of folks seem upset, saying that Mueller has handed Trump a win. Uh, but has he really? I mean, I think right now every right-wing nut job is praising Mueller, uh, which they never have before. <laughs> Trump's never thanked Mueller. He's never had a nice word to say about him. I have total faith Mueller knows exactly what he's doing. He knew this this was going to happen if he did this. Um, exactly why he did something, um, I'm sure we'll be debating for a long time <laughs> to come. Uh, Trump made this statement in support of Mueller on the South Lawn before taking off to pay respects to four dead Americans, victims of an ISIS bombing in Syria. Uh, he said, it was a total phony story. Total phony story. And I appreciate the special counsel coming out with a statement last night. Uh, again, this is coming from a guy who has not yet had one supportive word um, for an investigation which, if he were innocent, would serve to exonerate him of all wrongdoing. <laughs> but of course, that's not the reality. He's guilty and Mueller will bury the motherfucker. <laughs> yes, I said motherfucker. And I stand with Congresswoman <laughs> Tlaib when she called Trump a motherfucker too. Also the feckless cunt comment. I do. I stand behind that. Um, see, Tlaib, she called Trump a motherfucker because he's a motherfucker. He's a racist piece of misogynistic shit. Kanye called Trump a motherfucker and we're fine with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, everyone lost their minds when she did it. Uh, Trump calls people motherfuckers because they're Mexican or because they take a knee or because they're uh, women of color who are reporters. We can't equate these two kinds of motherfuckers. Uh, if I punched a guy that was assaulting me, would you say I'm just as bad as he is because I resorted to violence and the weight of setting the example of not kicking people in the dick is on me? <laughs> no way. No, because that is stupid. And so is this. So stop clutching your pearls over Gillette commercials and pay attention to context. Trump is a motherfucker. At least she didn't call him a child fucker, too. He should be happy. <laughs> Motherfucker's going light, man. <laughs> you don't want to be too honest. It's true, true. All right, guys, that is our show. Uh, we will catch you Wednesday night for the midweek update for patrons. If you're not a patron, become one at patreon.com slash MullerSheWrote. Check MullerSheWrote.com for tour information. We'll see you in Washington, D.C., March 29th, and Brooklyn on March 30th. I'm so excited to get out there and meet all of you guys. Uh, we haven't had a live show since July, so... <laughs> We are a little, um, you know, deprived of the sun. I'm uh, stoked, man. We'll get out and we'll come see you. We're working on other dates, too, including NorCal, San Francisco, Twin Cities, um, that's Minneapolis, Chicago, Portland, Seattle, hopefully Canada, UK, Australia. I have big dreams. <laughs> uh, just keep checking our website for updates, MullerSheWrote.com. And don't forget, the Manafucked ringtone is for sale under Manafort Is, uh, wherever you get your ringtones. Proceeds go to Voices of Our City Choir, a choir compromised of compromised <laughs> <Acquired. Being> compromised, <laughs> compromised by Russia. the harsh realities <laughs> yeah the Russians got him Jordan <laughs> a choir comprised of homeless people in San Diego we want all of the proceeds to go to them and please help support our patron uh, AM impacted by the Trump shutdown it's your birthday this week um, so head to GoFundMe search for MSW patron and practice your get your random acts of kindness on get them on <laughs> Uh, thank you for all the birthday wishes, you guys. And remember, if I call myself old, I'm joking, but I do hope you guys find a way to freeze my head and keep me alive <laughs> so I can get an historical perspective. Oh, hell yeah. On this investigation, future beans. Uh, you guys have any last thoughts, party thoughts? Yeah. Happy birthday it weekend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's AG's birthday weekend. That's right. Thanks, guys. Of Happy course. fucking birthday. Hell Thanks, yes. Friends. Yeah, totally. We've been enjoying a nice Pinot Noir. You did. You bought me a really nice bottle. What yeah. Is this the nicest the cheap liquor store had. <laughs> mm. It was. It, it's very good. Yes. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Happy birthday, our fearless leader. Um, I'm afraid of stuff. I'm afraid of them some. You're things. afraid of what? Birthdays? Uh, oh. Like spiders that come and hang, like, <laughs> descend upon you when you don't, when you can't see them coming. Yeah, they're scary. That happened to me and uh, my best friend. We were at, uh, you know, the girl who does our 
branding and our uh, web design. Uh, she, Joelle. Yeah, she's mm-hmm. best friend for like 25 years. We used to go to golf clubs when we were kids. And we're standing there at, at a golf club just gothing. <laughs> and this <laughs> spider comes down. And we see it and we're like, and we start <laughs> at it and like trying to light it on fire. We're like, Wah! And all the goths on the patio are looking at us like, oh, don't you dare hurt that spider. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some little goth guy comes up and grabs the spider in his hand and like gives us this stern look and walks away. <laughs> like all life is precious. Protective of the beautiful gothy spider and releases him into the wild of Point Loma. And I'm like, dude, all right. And, and Joelle's like, we're not good goths. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's okay. I still like Susie and the Banshees, but you're right. I'm just kind of yeah, that's so spider. funny. So fearless, mostly. Yes, Lee. You are the rock, though, of this podcast. And, and yeah, you know, you're, you're entitled to a couple of fears, but you're pretty badass in this area. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. This is, um, wouldn't be possible without AG, everyone. So send birthday vibes. Yes. Thank you for the birthday vibes. I yes. appreciate it. And um, thank you to your mama for bearing you. That's right. I should call her. Boring? Bearing. 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 Yes. yes. Boring you. Bear arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bear. <laughs> right. right to bear arms. Also, your dad. He did. He did. Yeah. You, you know. Did his know. part. <laughs> yeah. He put a lot of work into that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I got all my uh, comedy and music comes from dad. So. Oh, cool. Hell yeah. yeah, dado. All right, guys. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful and positive week. Chins up. Uh, fear not. Muller's got this. And look for the silver lining, all that other shit. Inspirational poster. <laughs> do, 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 do some yoga. Whatever you need to do. Self-care. Massively important. Self-care. Again. So take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. I've been AG. I've been Jaleesa Johnson. I've been Jordan Coburn. And this is Muller She Wrote. Muller She Wrote is produced and engineered by AG with editing and logo design by Jaleesa Johnson. Our marketing consultant and social media manager is Sarah Lee Steiner, and our subscriber and communications director is Jordan Coburn. Fact-checking and research by AG, and research assistance by Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn. Our merchandising managers are Sarah Lee Steiner and Sarah Hirschberger Valencia. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios, and our website is MullerSheWrote.com. 